In the Weimar Republic, from 1930 to 1933, the government was in disarray. The government had a nice liberal government run from 1924 to 1929, with the most socially liberal policies at that time in the world, with LBGT rights in full swing, gay and trans rights research, social safety nets, and the most representative government in the world. However, they also had an easily dissolvable government, which ended up being its downfall. In 1930, the Great Depression swept the world, the liberal, the liberal government lost the election that year, and parties changed governments in rapid succession, and at one time there were three general elections in one year, flooding the average voter with information overload about what was even happening and who to keep track of. During that time, the nation was swinging further right, and communism and leftism were being less tolerated, as the brown shirts and leftists, both made up of hardened soldiers from World War I, paired off against each other as they battled in the streets. Any violence the left did was hyped, while anything the Nazis did was minimized, as the courts, police, and most of the newspapers were owned by conservatives, and were much more likely to sympathize with the Nazis than leftists, as leftists were bad for business. The cops and courts also let the Nazis off with a slap on the wrist, while leftists were cracked down on profusely with police brutality. Literally at that point, the only thing that allowed them to spread their message was a liberal government who believed in free speech and a free press. However, at the loss of the liberal government in 1930, the government bounced from centrist to conservative and back. The liberal party could have had enough votes a few times to form a coalition government with the leftist parties, but they refused. Communists were getting their orders from the Soviet Union to do everything to put a wrench in the gears in hopes of a people's communist revolution once things got so bad, while other leftists were angry at liberals for not being more on the hardline left. So governments kept falling, a new election kept happening, until January of 1933 when Paul von Hindenburg made a deal with Adolf Hitler to give him the chancellorship in a coalition government, thinking they could control Hitler. Immediately, anyone on the left and in the center were restricted from organizing and assembling. The members threatened and assaulted, some by police, but more often by the brown shirts. In February 27th of 1933, the Reichstag fire ensued, which Hitler blamed on communists and enacted martial law, suspending indefinitely many constitutional rights, cracking down on and killing communists, which were one of the four major parties of the time, while refusing to investigate the fire. Hitler used fear-mongering about the communists, claiming all the nation's problem on them. By March 15th, the Enabling Act was presented as a way to change the Constitution to give the Chancellorship more power to crack down on communists, and essentially gave Hitler a dictatorship. The Social Democratic leader, with some of the party members in prison as suspected communists, was the only one to speak up in the Reichstag against the act, and since so many on the left were in prison, and the centrist party was having threats on their lives and their families by the brown shirts, the enabling act passed, ending all democracy and free speech in Germany, leading to the deaths of millions. From 1850 onwards, American leftism slowly spread both from the writings of Karl Marx for socialism and communism, and the works of Pierre-Joseph Proudhon for anarchism. With these ideas, they began building coalitions and many attempts and failures to form unions with blood, sweat, and tears as the government would send the military or Pinkertons to suppress violently any union organization or striking under the argument that the workers had freely signed a contract with the big companies and they needed to keep their end of the deal, plus they owed money to the company store and needed to pay off their debts. They should have negotiated better at hiring if they didn't like the exploitative contract. After many trials and many errors, deaths, and massacres, the labor movement began to find its feet. While the socialists and communists were relatively nonviolent, the anarchists from 1880 to 1920 had some radically violent members that actively worked to assassinate and murder members of government, and corporate heads they thought would spark a revolution, including President McKinley. In 1818, due to all the violence, the Anarchist Exclusion Act gave J. Edgar Hoover the right to deport any non-citizen with anarchist ties he suspected. The war on the left began to have some very powerful tools. Socialist presidential candidate Eugene Debs had been thrown in prison in 1918 as well after speaking out against the war, and Woodrow Wilson branded him a traitor to the nation where he would run for president from prison up until 1920. With so many anarchists, especially violent ones, deported, anarcho-pacifism gained more and more traction in the anarchist community, setting up thoughts to the beat generation and the hippie movement. 
but kind of fading into the background as socialism and communism took to the foreground in the U.S. In the 30s, unions rose in power throughout the U.S. They were planning on moving to take over the hiring and firing and management of the day-to-day -day workplace. However, World War II came and unions put their fight on hold in solidarity with the war effort. The wartime propaganda put the Soviet Union in a good light, as they were our allies in the war, but as the dust settled, the USSR was now the only rival to the US. Harry Truman got into office knowing nothing about foreign affairs, and a Red Scare activist got his ear and he began speaking out against communism and the Soviet Union as being evil. It is believed by some that this was why he nuked Japan, because the Soviets were about to take Manchuria and Korea from Japan, cutting off their supply line, and we had leveled cities in Japan in bombing runs that rivaled the atomic bomb, but he went ahead with the atomic bomb to tell the Soviets that we had it, and to let them know not to mess with us. Many of the left's best organizers died in the war, and when they came back to get back to having a union takeover of the workplace and labor in general, the right and corporate leaders, having not had to be in the war, were ready for them, pushing pro-capitalist, anti-socialist propaganda. The Berlin blockade didn't do the commies any favors in the eyes of the Americans, as the Soviets refused to allow ground aid to West Berlin, in hopes that they would join East Germany. America, in a show of tactical force of will, sent one of the best logistics supply chains to West Berlin via airlift that the world had ever seen, and after a year, Russia finally conceded and lifted the blockade. It culminated to its highest when the Rosenbergs were discovered to have passed on secrets of the bomb to the commies, and at that point, the right was able to use fear of commie spies to strip people of their basic rights, if suspected, in any way of red sympathies. The Taft-Hartley Act stripped unions of some of their most powerful strike and boycott tactics and purged around 20% of the union leaders as they were socialist or communist. This brought union expansion to a halt at 30% of the jobs of the nation and over the years has been chipped away by vilifying it as an elite club of lazy people who can't get fired until it reached 10% at this point. The McCarthy hearings purged and blacklisted anyone of influence if they had any potential ties or sympathies to Marx or anarchism. Free thought became dangerous. Leftism was dead. The mainstream completely misrepresented Marx and forgot anarchism. Only a few academic elites even knew what it was. The Cold War prevented ideas alternative to capitalism to even be discussed. It wasn't until the Berlin Wall fell and then the collapse of the Soviet Union that it became safe again to discuss leftist thought. But so many people now had a comical, distorted view of what leftism even was, and it wasn't until the rise of the internet and the constant stagnation of wages starting with Reagan, busting the air traffic controller strike, that leftism began to gain traction again. In 2011, the Occupy Wall Street movement started. Young people angry, confused, and jobless in the heart of the recession with the highest income inequality since before the Great Depression gathered and set up camps in the park across from the New York Stock Exchange. The fact that banks were bailed out and people were having their homes foreclosed unfairly on the left and right came to a head in anger. Unfortunately, not only had leftism been utterly suppressed, but so had civics, political tactics, and public engagement. And most young people knew only one tactic, protesting. They had no clue as to how to change the levers of power because these tools had been effectively silenced as well. Three of the top politicians to represent Occupy were Representative Barney Frank, Senator Bernie Sanders, and Elizabeth Warren, who was recruited by Occupy to run for Senate and won. In 2016, Bernie ran and was probably surprised at how well he was doing, and only halfway through did he really start pulling together an actual campaign, at which point it was too late to get people signed up to vote in the primary, and many suddenly found themselves unable to vote for him because closed primaries that had always existed blocked them from voting because they were completely illiterate in local political rules. Many brand new leftists became polarized and purists and refused to vote or voted for Jill Stein. Influence from Russian interference added to the polarization along with fake news and agitprop pretending to be leftist. And America elected Donald Trump the furthest you can get from a liberal or leftist in any sense of the word. Since then, among the far left, liberal has become a pejorative, equal with moderate or centrist because they refuse to condone aggressive violence. Centrists view the alt-right and Antifa the same, while liberals are sympathetic and support Antifa, but do not support certain wings of Antifa that destroy property or start fights. These wings are tiny and few and far between. They are a tiny fraction of a minority of Antifa. 
both being much rarer, especially compared with the aggravated violence of the far right. Liberals believe they can use the system to restore unions and the social safety net, while the far left is all over the place in what they think. But they know they hate liberals as corporate shills. Thankfully, in 2018, enough leftists put aside their anti-liberal bias to help elect a Democratic House, made up of a gradient of people from AOC, who would probably be just considered a centrist in most European nations, all the way to some slightly center-right, because other than in the Northeast, there is pretty much no room for centrists in the Republican Party. Democrats in Congress are made up at the moment of 50% moderate liberals from rather conservative areas and 50% progressive to leftist members. That said, there is a lot of disdain among the baby movement that is American leftism for giving any quarter to liberals or working with them. They demand a purity test, especially on the presidential primary. Many claim that since Warren didn't side with Bernie and calls herself a capitalist, which in liberals' minds just means the free market, but to a leftist mind means the owner of the means of production that uses their wealth to get more wealth out of the labor of others, she is just a corporate shill, even though Warren's policies are much more radical and precise than Bernie's, including the very leftist idea of forcing all corporations to have half their board and voting power made up of representatives of the workplace so that profit stops being the only motive. Bernie has only ever discussed free health care and education and a few other vagaries, which is really not very leftist at all, just a basic social safety net if you think about it. That said, many internet leftists denigrate all liberals. Many supposed anarchs and leftists in both America and the UK were against voting as a form of protest, allowing the right wing to come into power and crush and suppress the leftist message. One thing you can always rely on liberals to do is protect your right to free speech even if they defend the far right's freedom of speech. Without a far left wing to exist in the U.S., America got further and further right until Obama, who would have been considered a centrist by Reagan-era politics, was painted as a communist by the right wing media. And without the far left in the conversation, the far right was able to gain ground. We need the far left to be allowed to speak. Our system is screwed up in a two-party system, so we only get two sets of views. With activism for ranked choice voting like they have in Maine, we could actually have multiple parties across the spectrum running without silencing anyone. Not voting as a leftist of any stripe in the U.S. is the most surefire way to ensure your ideas can't spread through suppression. Something you as a baby movement who didn't exist 10 years ago desperately need to survive and thrive. Voting for liberals you may hate are still better than not voting and letting conservatives get in power and squash you and everything you care about if there's a leftist candidate, vote for them in the primary, but in the general, vote for the liberals just out of self-preservation, or your message and your right to spread it will be smushed. Just like with the Red Scare and the Weimar Republic, never take your right for free speech for granted. Or, you will end up losing it and leftism will spend decades as a taboo subject and a caricature of what it actually believes in the public mind. Once again. So thank you so much for joining me on my podcast. I'm sure there was nothing controversial about this and everyone will happily get along in the comments section, which you can do on the YouTube version of this video, link in the show notes. Just a reminder that I'm Anubis2814 on YouTube and I have over 500 videos on different topics that I've made over the past 10 years. Please subscribe and if your podcast site has the option, give me a like or review. If you think what I have to say informed you, consider supporting my Patreon. I'll be doing this podcast weekly and try to get it out on the same day, so I hope to see you here next week, ready to be filled with new ideas. Take care. A big thank you goes out to Elias Garcia Guevara and Joe Taylor, who sponsor the show at $10 a month at the Wapawet level on Patreon. Please consider donating as well if you can, and thank you all for listening.